This is Lauren Dunlop, Executive Director for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, or ADA, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm happy to host this afternoon's educational webinar. ADA's mission is to provide support and advocate for the greater than 25 million Americans living with immune disorders. ADA's work is to promote research and create better awareness of immune disorders. This is ADA's first webinar for 2023, and today I'm delighted to be joined by our own medical director and allergist immunologist, Dr. Jennifer Casado. Jennifer Casado um, is a practicing allergist immunologist in Charlotte, North Carolina at Carolina Asthma and Allergy Center. Dr. Casado is a fellow of both the American College of Allergy Asthma Immunology and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Casado is past president of the Charlotte Pediatric Society, where she still serves on the organization's board. She is also past president of the North Carolina Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Society and current executive medical director for ADA. Dr. Casado has been involved in multiple clinical research studies in food allergy, atopic dermatitis, eosivilic, so <laughs> help me out here, Dr. Casado. I always get that yes, wrong. Eosivilic yes, esophagitis. Thank you, <laughs> esophagitis, got tongue tied, and asthma, as well as multiple national quality improvement studies. Dr. Casado believes strongly in adv advocacy and has been actively involved in both her local and national medical communities. Dr. Casado was proud to assist in the efforts to obtain funding for one registered nurse for every local public Charlotte Mecklenburg school, as well as implementing stop epi epinephrine throughout CMS. Thank you so much, Dr. Casado, for joining us this afternoon. Yes, thank you, Lauren. So I'm very happy to, Lauren has been asking me for a while to give a webinar, so I'm very <laughs> happy to finally get to do it. And um, I happy. speak with my hands, so I'm not gonna be on camera because you'd also be waving <laughs> my hands around. But um, I, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and at the, at the end of the presentation, I'll kind of tell you how I came to become involved in, in this particular um, subject matter. But we're basically, um, the title of my, my talk is Born into the Climate Crisis, the Effects of Climate Change on Our Children. And Ada, um, Lauren already went through the mission statement. Um, at the bottom of the slide is the Ada um, contact information, um, if anyone would like that as well. So this first slide um, is something that has been in the news recently. This is actually a story from the LA Times. Um, and basically we know that California has been experiencing a great deal of flooding. And this was a story about Montecito, which I've never been to Montecito, but my understanding is it's a very nice community, um, very um, higher on the socioeconomic chain. And so this article was basically about the devastation from these floods in this, in this area. Um, and we do know that these effects, these, these big storm events, these weather changes um, actually affect lower socioeconomic areas um, more than they do the higher ones. So you can just imagine, you know, the story that they didn't publish um, about other areas of California. And if this article had been in the summer, um, it would have been about the fires because clearly um, California also has issues with, with their wildfires as well. Oops, went too far. Okay, so talking about um, child health in a changing climate. Um, so basically, what I'm going to start with has to do with heat and rising temperatures. Um, there is um, some effect of extreme weather that we'll talk about, um, basically infectious disease. So because of the changes in the weather and increased water from increased rains, um, mosquitoes, ticks, there's a difference in their life cycles that does affect that. Um, and the effect on plant allergens, um, which also you know, has to do with um, ties into asthma and respiratory diseases. So this is a good map um, about the health um, in different areas. So what areas are impacted by which types of, of issues? And so I am in the Southeast, um, so I will just 
you can mark those. And wherever you are from, you can look in that area if you're from a different area of the country. But in the Southeast, we have issues with air quality, um, extreme temperatures, um, mental health and well being is affected, mosquito and tick borne infections, um, as well as water related infections and extreme weather events. So why are children more vulnerable? Um, so the first day in medical, not medical school, yeah, in medical school when I started my third year of rotation. So during your third year, it may be different now, but back in the day when I went to medical school, you did clinical rotations during your third year. And it was very exciting because they gave you a white coat and you really felt like you were finally going to be a doctor. Um, I remember the first day of my pediatrics rotation, my attending looked at all of us and said, lesson number one, children are not little adults. Um, if you have already done your internal medicine rotation or your family medicine rotation, do not treat them the way you treated the adults. They are not just smaller versions. They have their own unique characteristics. Um, and they do. Um, so basically, they breathe faster. Um, they actually eat more per their weight. So the appearance may not be that they're eating more than adults eat, but they actually eat more per their body weight than adults do. Um, they are more immature. They have not matured physically. They have not matured mentally, cognitively. Um, so they are more susceptible to things that someone who had matured fully would not be susceptible to. And, um, you know, they have different windows of vulnerability. So definitely when they're growing, when their brain's growing, when they're growing in height, um, in weight, things like that. And they're outside more, which is good. They're supposed to be. We want them to be. But they are outdoors more, so they are going to be more susceptible to what is outside. So by far, um, and I say by far, but it's not really. It's pretty close. If the elderly are the most, are the group that is affected most by climate change. But the pediatric population is a close second. Um, and I think the numbers at this point are in the high 40s. Um, and so um, of those, greater than 88% are going to be under the age of five. So they seem to be you know, disproportionately affected. Um, children with low resources, um, in, both in countries that are westernized and not, are at the higher, higher risk. And so what we're going to review today um, are issues that are you know, seen throughout the world, but um, in the US and in increased severe heat events, um, the effects of the changes in the pollen allergy season, um, infectious disease patterns, and the worsening of severe weather events. So the first issue I'm gonna to touch on are heat illnesses. Um, and they're both exertional and non-exertional. So by far the exertional is seen more in high school athletes and by far more in football players. Um, they are actually 12 times more likely to suffer um, heat illnesses than all the other sports combined. Um, these tend to occur more during August um, in the in the warmer months. So you don't really hear about it this time of year, but come you know come the summer um, and when football practices start, we'll start hearing about cases cases of this. And the issue with these is that when the body heats up, the body, you know, likes to be at a certain temperature. And it's okay being a little warmer than that. But once it starts to get too warm, your muscles will actually start to break down. And your heart is a muscle. So when you think about it, you know, not a good, not a good scenario. Um, but it'll cause kidney failure from muscle breakdown, you know, all sorts of issues. I'm sorry, my slides have a mind of their own, but um, so, you know, that's, that's where this comes into, you know, being, a, you know, it's becoming an increasing cause of death in these, in these athletes. And it's actually the third major cause of death in teenage athletes behind traumatic and cardiac causes. Um, and this just shows there's been a rising um, of the ED visits for these issues over the years. So there's also non-exertional heat illnesses. And these are the stories you also hear during the summer. And these are the heartbreaking stories. So the young children who were left in the car um, and they're not able to you know, get, at, get out of their car seats and um, where they were sleeping. And the car, you know, as you know, if you in the summer, if you close your windows and close the doors of your car, it gets very, very warm. Um, and so basically children under one are at an increased risk of this. Um, 
they don't thermoregulate well, um, so kids don't control their body temperatures as well as adults do. Um, and there, um, there's a high rate of mortality from this. Um, Okay, and so why are the children more vulnerable? They make more heat. Um, they have a higher body surface to mass ratio. Um, they have a lower blood volume, so they can't get rid of the heat um, because we are dependent on the blood flow to our skin and other surfaces to dissipate heat. And so they don't have as much blood to circulate. They have a lower rate of sweat production than adults do, um, and they're more dependent on others to replace their fluid losses. They need to be given something to drink or make sure when there are practices, they have enough water and they're being given opportunities to drink it. Um, so they're more dependent um, and not able necessarily to replace their fluids themselves. And they don't acclimate to higher temperatures um, as quickly as adults do. So if you put an adult in a higher temperature situation, you know, maybe within five days, their bodies will have acclimated to it. A child may take, you know, 10 to 14 days to acclimate. So the next subject is near and dear to my heart because it's what I do. Um, so the climate change and the effects on allergies. And I could not find a picture of a child that wasn't a copyright infringement, so I apologize. Um, so the um, one of the main organizations, um, the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, or otherwise known as the Quad AI, sent out a survey in 2015 to its um, members. And basically what they asked was, you know, first of all, you know, what are your views on climate change? You know, first of all, do you believe it exists, it, that it's really happening? And over 80% of respondents said that they did believe it was happening. So this was sent out to, you know, board certified allergists and immunologists. 76% um, indicated that they felt like it was by some degree caused by human activities. So, right, where we source our energy, our driving habits, um, you know, all sorts of things that we know can influence, can influence the climate. 63% um, think it's relevant to direct patient care. Um, and 74% thought that it is affecting the health of their personal own patients. Um, and the amount varied, so a great deal, 10%, moderate amount, 38%, or only a little, 26%. So what effects are they, they seeing? And so the most common ones were um, air pollution-related increases and in severity of chronic disease. And so this really is respiratory diseases. So whether it's severe asthma or even asthma that's not severe, COPD, um, you know, there are some other more rare lung diseases that we take care of. Um, so this is really, you know, the highest, the highest effect they, you know, they felt like they were seeing was in that population. Um, but not far behind an increase in allergy um, symptoms. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that very soon. Um, injuries and, um, you know, heat related effects. So heat illnesses, vector borne infections, which we'll touch on in a little while. Um, and then just, you know, diarrhea from water food borne infections. Um, and so, and what they also thought was, you know, we're seeing this now and in 10 to 20 years, we're probably going to be seeing more harm caused by climate related issues. So, what, how does climate change affect pollen production? So um, basically, and, and a lot of the studies have been done on ragweed because it's a single pollen, whereas trees, there are, you know, hundreds of different species. And so it's harder to, to nail it down. But with ragweed, since it's a single pollen um, and it tends to, you know, have a specific season that you can say, okay, well, let's look at ragweed. Um, but clearly this is happening with all of the other pollens as well. And so basically ragweed plants grow faster, they flower earlier, they produce greater amounts of pollen. Um, and so this is all linked to carbon dioxide. So where there's in urban areas, there's greater levels of carbon dioxide, there's increased temperatures, um, and so you will get more pollen. And this is higher in compared to rural areas, probably because in, in urban areas, you have a lot more traffic, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more places for there to be this air pollution produced um, as opposed to rural areas. Um, and then if you double the atmosphere concentration of carbon dioxide, you get a 61% increase in your ragweed pollen production. So the other 
thing, um, they looked at Timothy grass. And so Timothy grass also seems to increase if you increase atmospheric um, carbon dioxide. So if it's double the amount, you get a 200% increase in pollen. Um, and then if you look at ozone levels, um, it's also affected by ozone. So if you have um, increased ozone levels, then it will increase the pollen production as well. So the other thing that comes along with this, so there's more pollen, but there's also longer seasons. And so this talks about ragweed, but the truth is, is that, you know, even our tree pollen seasons, I mean, since I began practicing, I can tell you, I used to tell patients, oh, you know, start your medicines, you know, mid to late February. Well, now I have patients who are symptomatic mid-January. Um, so you really have seen a shift in you know when people are beginning to have symptoms um, and the seasons are lasting for longer and so you don't see a clear you know we used to be able to tell patients okay tree pollen season will be over by the time school gets out and grass pollen season should be done by labor day and ragweed season starts you know starts around the end of august and will be done by the first frost and so we're really not because the that, that frost sometimes doesn't come and so you know we have these much longer seasons um and so of course this is going to vary by where you are geographically um but you know here in the southeast I, I definitely think that we've begun to have longer pollen seasons as you can see here it's in other areas of the country as well and it's great for my business but you know not so great for the patients who are affected by by this so the other thing that carbon dioxide does is it makes our food less nutritious. Um, and that's something that's not really talked about a lot. Um, and so, you know, we do know in wheat, it will decrease the amount of protein in the wheat. Um, and so, you know, this becomes an issue because, you know, we're trying to, you know, what do, what do you eat? Why do you eat? Well, you eat for enjoyment, but you also eat because you need certain the things in your diet you need protein you need certain nutrients and so um you know the the atmosphere and what's going on in, with pollution is affecting our actual food sources as well um it also decreases iron and zinc so in wheat rice and soybeans um and the other thing here um you know children are going to be at higher risk of iron deficiency in general um, and so, you know, this is going to affect them again, disproportionately. So once you start messing with, you know, the nutrients of the food, because children are so dependent on food for their, you know, for their growth, um, it will start to affect them. The other thing that I do not have a slide about that is, hasn't had a lot of research, but is, is beginning to be something that is being looked into is the allergenicity of food. Um, so it is thought that elevated CO2 actually makes plant um, plant um, food proteins more allergenic. So the big ones that they are looking at and have seen it with are peanut, as well as soy, as well as wheat, um, and actually mustard seed. Um, so it's it's very interesting because, you know, as we talk about, you know, why are there more, you know, why are there more allergies, you know, yes, there is, this is a very dense topic and there's a lot of reasons, but, you know, the food itself could also be becoming more allergenic because of climate change. So um, Lyme disease, um, and this is kind of a hot topic, and I am by no means an expert on Lyme disease. Um, I do see some patients who, you know, say that they have chronic Lyme or have had Lyme disease in the past or, or are worried that they have chronic Lyme, um, but it by no means is, is what I do day to day. Um, but because of the changes in the weather pattern, we are actually seeing more Lyme disease. And so um, boys, um, and how does this affect the pediatric population? Well, boys five to nine years of age are at greatest risk because they're out running around in the woods and where are the ticks in the woods? Um, and so um, this specific tick, which I'm not gonna even try to pronounce, um, but basically otherwise known as the deer tick, um, is you know, what carries the Lyme disease. Um, and so the, the range of where this is has been expanded um, and so you're seeing more and more Lyme disease because the range is expanded. And so the symptoms include a rash. This rash here is very characteristic um, of the Lyme rash. 
and um, arthritis, meningitis, and occasionally heart block. And you know, then there's this whole concept of chronic Lyme, which I think is a little controversial, but um, you know, there there probably does really exist in certain individuals who are susceptible to it for you know genetic reasons. Um, there are probably certain people who do develop this because they're born with certain genetic factors that make them more predisposed. So this just shows how the disease is kind of spreading. So in 1996, where you would see it, and now you're seeing it um, into, in 2013, um, how it's spread. And there's an earlier Lyme season. So, you know, the ticks are, are dependent on, they don't breed well, you know, or, or live well when it's very, very cold. They don't breed or live well when it's very, very hot. Um, so they kind of have to have some, some ambient temperature there to really breed the best. So the warmer winters, because it doesn't get real cold, does lead to their season starting off sooner um, than it used to be before. I'm gonna kind of skip over this. This is um, mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, so obviously the thing about mosquitoes um, is that you know we have these fl this flooding, um, these, these water events. So as there's cold water, standing water, um, mosquitoes breed. Um, and then also with warmer temperatures, mosquitoes love warmer temperatures. And so, you know, there, there is gonna be more mosquitoes, therefore more mosquito, you know, mosquito-borne illnesses like Zika. Um, as well as, um, you know, the other diseases that mosquitoes carry. So I'm going to move a little bit more into the air pollution itself and the health, health risks for kids associated with those. Um, and so they're listed here. I don't need to read them all. You guys can all read them. Um, but clearly, you see, they can affect basically every, um, every organ system. And so why are children at risk again? And we've kind of, you know, gone over some of the reasons. It's kind of the same reason they're at risk of the heat, the heat illnesses. They, you know, they have, um, they breathe faster. They are outdoors more. They are more physiologic immature. They're more dependent on other people for where they live. So they don't pick if they live in a very polluted area of the country, or you know, even if they're you know within a certain distance of a major roadway, and so you know they're not in control of that. Um, they also are not in control of whether or not they seek medical care. Right? They're dependent on parents and other people to take them to the doctors. So, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons why children are, are more at risk of these things. And so, what makes the air unhealthy? Um, well, there's ozone. Um, and that kind of results from the heat and the sun in combination with what's already in the atmosphere. So you've got the, you know, the, the pollution that's coming from the plants and you've got the VOCs that are coming from the, um, from the paints and the, the, the diesel with the cars. And so you have all of the different things coming together with the, with the sun um, to create the ozone. You have year round particles. And so those are the particles that kind of hang out in the air and are always there, whether they be from fires or from, again, from automobiles um, or from plants that are um, different manufacturers that are producing the pollution. And then there are the short term things. So, you know, the things that are sporadic, um, that are more like wildfires, things like that, that, that kind of come and go. So this is a little bit of a geeky, sciencey slide, but it just talks about the non-allergen environmental factors that affect um, allergic diseases, and so and and the sources of them. So you know, if you kind of want to, if you kind of want to do more research into this and know, okay, well, exactly what are the the particles causing the causing the problem, and where do they come from? Um, this is a good reference slide for you. So to kind of talk about, well, where does nitric oxide come from? Um, where does PM two point five come from? Um, and when, you know, when and how is ozone made? So ground level ozone. So ozone way up in the sky is good, right? That's supposed to protect us. Um, and, you know, it's, I think that I just, I read something saying that maybe our ozone layer was getting a little bit better because I know that there have been concerns for a long time that it was just um, thinning and getting worse and had holes in it. Um, but there's ground level ozone and ground level ozone is not good. So ground level ozone is like a smog you see. 
Um, and so when you can see it, but a lot of these, these um, particles are so small that you can't see them unless there are millions and millions and millions of particles together. And so basically it forms from these particles plus the sun um, that create the ozone. So the ozone standards were revised in 2015, to my knowledge, and I did look this up. They have not been revised again since 2015. So previously they were at 75 parts per billion and the new standard was 70. The American Lung Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics had both urged a lower standard. And this is just a little bit about the sizes of these particles. Um, so when you're looking, when you're looking, thinking about, and these are very, very small, like, you know, microscopic compared to even a human hair. And so this just kind of illustrates that. But this isn't necessarily something you see um, in the air. Um, and again, you get, you do, you know, have smog and you can see that once it gets very, very bad, but, you know, it's there and we don't, you know, we don't always realize that it's there. So this is again a little bit of a geeky slide, but this is this is what um, is exciting for me because as much as I am an advocate for policy changing and things that will prevent the production or as much production of these of these particles and these um, chemicals that cause these these um, issues with pollution, you know you have to be realistic and think well a that some of the damage has already been done to human health, right? Um, and then also, you know, we'll probably never be able to completely eliminate it. So there are these things called cytokines. And if you see those T uh, TLR2, TLR4, all of those numbers. Um, and so we've already um, designed these biologics to treat um, diseases that I take care of. So asthma and atopic dermatitis. Um, and so they are targeting some of these um, these cytokines. Now, the ones that are out now do not target these specific cytokines, but I do think, you know, as we, you know, learn more about particularly the respiratory diseases that are caused by, um, that are caused by um, climate change, that there's going to be a chance um, with ADA, we do work with pharmaceutical companies and um, to work on projects and obtain funding, you know, to kind of, you know, say, hey, you know, these people who, these patients who don't seem to respond to the biologics that we give for, you know, anti-eosinophil and eosinophils are allergy white blood cells, but we give them for those disease states, you know, are there other things that are causing their lungs? Like they don't seem to have eosinophilic asthma, they have a different type, they have a different type of lung issue. You know, you could start, you know, creating some biologics that specifically target the the damage that's been done by climate change. And so to me, that's that's exciting that there may potentially be some, some therapeutic um, answer in the future. And so um, air pollution. Um, so basically it makes the airways more, I like to describe it to my patients, twitchy, which means they're more hyper-responsive, um, meaning that they're gonna be more responsive, you know, if they, you breathe in like, like a, strong odor, you may be more likely to react because you've been exposed to air pollution. Or if you have a lot of pollen allergy and you breathe some in, your airways are going to be more hyper-responsive than maybe they normally would have been if you are, you know, if you are affected by air pollution. They increase the airway inflammation, um, decreased lung function. This all results in increased hospitalizations and ED visits. And, you know, again, I talked about the airway inflammation as well as the bronco um, hyperresponsiveness being allergen driven. And um, it primes the airways to the allergic responses. And this next slide kind of shows that. So this is what ozone does. So ozone irritates the lungs. It makes people more vulnerable um, to the effects of small particles and allergens. So if you look in the, in the picture, um, to the left, it's got a nice um, open airway without, you know, lots of inflammation. Um, and then as you move over, you see the, the tightening of the smooth muscle, the air trapping, because the air can't get in and out and there's an inflamed airway there. So um, we think that air pollution will skew the um, the immune system towards what we call a Th2 response. And Th2 response is kind of the, the, it's the allergy part of the immune system. So, you know, most allergy, most asthma is, you know, on that, on that Th2 side. 
And so um, basically it's thought that, well, this is, this is just increasing all things, you know, aller allergenic and asthmatic. Um, and it also may decrease the ability of, um, to make viral responses. So to, to fight viruses and to, you know, to kind of your immune system in general. Um, so this really is, you know, air, air pollution is having what we, what we call an immunomodulatory effect. And, um, you know, there are studies that show that children that live within a certain um, mile distance of heavily traveled um, expressways um, do, you know, develop asthma more often. And so, you know, again, we talked about children can't choose where they live, um, where they play, where they go to school. So adults make these decisions for them. So, um, you know, the, the policies um, and, and adults are the ones who can vote, right? So they are the ones in charge of setting the policies which determine, you know, the air they breathe and the water they drink is clean and safe. So, you know, they are not, um, you know, they are not in charge of their environment. They are not in charge of the policies that control their environment. So again, they're, they're obviously more susceptible to, to these, these changes and these things they can't control. So I just want to um, give a little um, plug for tobacco smoke exposure because, you know, there's a thought that we already know it's bad, right? I mean, we tell I tell my parents who smoke, you know, don't, don't stop smoking first of all, but if you can't, um, you know, you're going to have to not only do it outside, but then you're going to have to literally come into the house, wash, take a shower, take off your clothes, wash, put the clothes somewhere um, where they're not going to just that secondhand smoke is going to come off of them and get into the shower and wash your hair before you go anywhere near your child. Well, I'll tell you, most people don't do that. And so um, this is, um, you know, there is thought that with exposure to air pollution, the harmful effects from tobacco smoke that we know already occur in children who are exposed to secondhand and thirdhand smoke, um, you know, it may even be increased. Um, so you know, just you know, kind of a plug for the, the not smoking, but also that air pollution may link to increased damage. So what should we tell patients with respiratory diseases to do? Um, you know, it's it's always important to monitor the air, the air quality. So, you know, those red days, orange days, things like that, and the smog alerts. Um, you know, I always encourage them to not go outdoors as much um, on those days. Um, and if they have to, just to make it minimum, keep the, the, the windows in their car um, up, do not open the windows of their house. Um, of, try to avoid living in areas near high automobile traffic, power plants, or chemical manufacturing plants. But again, this is not something that's, you know, easy to control. And um, just um, running the AC, avoiding passive smoke, keeping the windows closed, like I talked about. Um, and you know they can you know document with peak flow rates. There's actually um, I just heard last night my pra my practice is going to pilot a program for home spirometry, um, where you could actually monitor home spirometry um, to kind of see you know how they're doing based on you know different exposures that they may get. And this is just a little bit about the, if you've never seen what the air quality index is, um, this is what it is. Um, and so it's based on a numerical val value um, based on ozone and particle pollution. Um, so, you know, people with lung disease, children, older adults, um, more sensitive to ozone and particle pollution, kind of heart and lung disease for um, particle pollution. And children are considered sensitive and at greater risk or greater greater risk. So kids kind of go into the in greater risk category, um, you know, even without asthma or anything like that. So you do want to monitor these uh, these air qualities. And these are different sources where you can find different information about air quality. And so how does policy shape public health? Um, Oh, there we go. So basically, this is just a reminder that all of these, and basically policy is shaped in public health. It's mostly, it's shaped by the people who are affected by it, right? Those are the people who will start, you know, pushing through 
um, or trying to get legislation passed that'll, you know, limit these things. And so this is an example. So, you know, you, gas used to be leaded. Um, and apparently, I was very young, I think the last time, very, very young, the last time there was leaded gas, but apparently from what the studies show, everyone had lead in their system when there was leaded gas. Like there wasn't anyone who was immune, whether you were pumping the gas or around the gas or not around the gas, just because it was in the environment. Um, so the push for, you know, unleaded fuel, um, speed limits um, to make their to make people not drive as fast, not causing as much accidents. Something as simple as putting fire alarms into, into public buildings, um, things like that. All of these are things, seatbelts, um, you know, all of these are things that were, you know, used to be, you know, not regulated. Um, and then there was policy that shaped it so that there would be some regulation. Oh, and food labels at the bottom there. That's, that's a big one that's near and dear to my heart, labeling labeling foods, both for caloric intake and fat intake and carbohydrate intake, but also for food allergens. So the Clean Air Act. Um, so prior to 1970, and I don't have this slide on there, but there's a slide I have of Tacoma, Washington, that just shows in 1972, that just shows the entire um, city is just in smog. And um, you know, prior to 1970 and the Clean Air Act, it was up to the states to regulate their own um, policies for um, pollution and ozone and things like that. And that did not work very well. Um, so the Clean Air Act of 1970 did really help. Um, and then there were amendments made in 1990. And so basically, um, if you look at all of these disease states that are, that are and, and lost work days, lost school days, emergency room visits, asthma exacerbations, all of these things. If you look at the, um, the number of cases that this is preventing, so the fact that there is a Clean Air Act preventing. Um, so in 2010, you know, there's 160,000 for mortality. It'll have prevented 230,000 adult deaths in 2020, which obviously has already passed. So, um, you know, this this public policy, this this really has shaped and really has saved lives, but we obviously have more work to do. So this is my story. Um, and I like, and I like to, I, I thought about replacing the picture, but I thought about when I started doing this, I felt like I was very young. So I wanted to remind myself how long it's been that I've been kind of talking about this subject. So. It was probably around 2015 um, when I saw a patient in my clinic and it was a little girl who, you know, had developed asthma and she was there with her father and we allergy tested her and she was completely negative and, you know, but we did the confirmatory breathing test. Uh, she, you know, gave her albuterol, she showed an adequate response, and so all of her symptoms consistent with asthma, and so I was talking with dad through the diagnosis, and he, and I remember he looked at me, and he said, because there was no family history, and he looked at me, and he said, could this have anything to do with the fact that we live right next to a major highway, and he's like, because I read something, <laughs> and I remember at that point being a honestly a little clueless on the matter, thinking to myself, well, I can see where that would be the case, but I didn't know very much about it. And so at that point, I figured that I needed to start knowing more about it if my patients were gonna know more about it and they were going to ask about it. And the more I read and the more I learned, um, the more I realized that, you know, this is, this is a, a colossal issue. Um, and so these are just some quotes that, um, that I um, I got to travel around the state of North Carolina um, a few years ago as the asthma champion. Um, and it was good because I got to speak about things like this. And so um, basically this is this has kind of become something that is near and dear to my heart. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Casado, for that amazing presentation. We are going to open it up um, to our audience members for, for the Q&A, the last um, 10 to 15 minutes. So feel free to type in any questions that you may have um, that came up during Dr. Casado's presentation. Um, so Dr. Casado, you mentioned, I gotta find, let me look at the questions right here. Okay. 
So you mentioned um, CO2 makes food less nutritious. Why is this not addressed more in, in the media or even in, is there more research being done around this? This, like you said, it's not something you really hear a whole lot about. Um, well, I, I, the answer is, is that no, you don't, you don't hear a lot about it. Um, but there are, you know, a lot of things that I probably spoke about that you don't, you don't hear, you know, we hear a lot about these big weather events, right? They're in the news all the time, but, you know, and, and about, you know, the, 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 you know, does fracking cause, you know, air pollution and if you don't know what fracking is it's the way that they harnessed um natural gas and oil um it's the method that they use um so you know all, all sorts of things that you you know hear about um and there are political buzzwords about you know what we should be doing in terms of, of air pollution but no you don't actually hear about these issues and i honestly think it's that you know they are being studied in very small small you know at a small level, but there's, I mean, all any sort of study that you do requires funding. And so my guess would be is that there's just not the funding there um, to fund studies like this, um, to, to, to really look at it more, um, to bring it more out into the, into the open, into the light. So it's, you know, an article here, an article there that looks at, that looks at these things. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's probably also like that with the food allergenicity. Um, you don't actually hear a lot about that, but again, we know that this is this this has the potential to also affect that. Thank you, Dr. Tosedo. What that was that was a very helpful answer. Since you've been practicing medicine, and your this is just a personal opinion, what do you think the percentage or the increase? of the number of children has been who are developing allergy or asthma and related conditions. Do you think it's been, what do you think that number looks like and the number of years you've been practicing? And how do we, where do we go from there with that number? And, um, you know, and, and this, this is a little bit controversial in terms, I mean, not the allergy part, because we definitely, definitely know. I mean, I would say it's doubled in terms of for allergy, particularly in younger kids. Um, so we're seeing allergy, you know, earlier and earlier. I mean, there would be a time when I would not even do outdoor testing on anyone younger than three. Then that dropped to two. Um, but I have seen very very positive skin testing to pollens um and not only you know because you figure yes they're going to be around dust mites and pets if there are pets in the home so yes they may develop those allergies but to outdoor things i mean i've had 18 month olds 15 month olds who test very very positive and that is just something that was unheard of um you know when i first started practicing i mean again we just we never even tested um, and it, you know, the same thing with food allergy, which is why we, you know, are trying so hard to combat that with early introduction of foods. Um, and then, you know, with asthma, it kind of, it's all on the same spectrum. So, I mean, I would say it's probably hasn't doubled like the allergy has, but it's probably, you know, 30% more. Um, and you're seeing it younger. And it's harder to give a definitive diagnosis when they're younger, when they can't do breathing tests. Um, but basically what we do is we look at, do they have eczema? Do they have food allergies? Do they ha have they developed like pollen or, you know, and even dog, cat, environmental allergies? And do they have a parent who, you know, parent, um, mother or father who has asthma? And the, the rate of development of asthma in, in a child who has started wheezing very young um, is gonna be up over 65% for, you know, for that certain scenario. Wow. So thank you for answering that, Dr. Casado. So you mentioned earlier um, Lyme disease and the culprit being the, the deer tick, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I guess, in other areas or regions of the country, is there also a rise in um, other specific tick illness-related illnesses, or, or is this really mainly the rise of the increase in the deer tick 
Um, no, it's, I mean, this is, this was kind of just a, you know, overview, but I mean, there, that's a whole subject matter in itself. I mean, it's because these, these ticks all, all have the same life cycle. So whether it be this or, you know, the only other, because I don't see, I mean, I don't necessarily see a lot of tick, like, like diagnose them because of what I do, people don't come to me for those things. Um, so those are things that are mostly diagnosed by either primary care doctors or maybe infectious disease doctors, things like that. But um, I can tell you that, you know, these ticks have the same, all have the same life cycle. They're not, you know, very different in terms of how they live and how they respond to temperatures. So whatever you see for one, you know, tick-borne disease, you're probably going to see for the other ones. Now, my guess would be that the other ones are even less common than Lyme. So, you know, you're not going to see as big of a, a bump in those numbers mm -hmm. because it, to start with, they weren't as common. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, there is a, so, so the only tick that is directly related to what I do is um, there is a tick that causes actually a, a meat allergy, um, a red meat allergy. And so um, that a tick bite. And so we have seen, we have definitely seen cases of that. It's something called alpha-gal um, increase over the years. Again, yeah, is it common? Do I see it? Do I see it? You know, do I see it maybe once every six months? Maybe. I mean, again, not when, when you say common, like not very common, but there's definitely been an increase. And again, it's because the, of the of what's happening with the ticks and the life cycles. Sure. Um, one of our audience members asked, um, can you speak about GMO and non-GMO? <laughs> um, genetically modified and non-genetically modified. Um, you know, it's, I don't, it's, it's not something I know a lot about, so I don't want to, you know, speak to, to knowing, um, you know, I know traditionally that um, not modifying our food has been, you know, thought to be better. Um, I, and, and I have read some things linking allergenicity to, to that. Um, but beyond that, I probably don't know a whole lot about the, the GMO versus non-GMO issue. Okay. Is heredity a, signif a significant factor in asthma and allergies? Um, it is, but it is um, it is a combination. So it's going to be a combination of genetic predisposition plus your environment. Um, and so, and that's where all all of this comes into play is that it's not just one thing. So, you know, I, you know, I get questions all the time that, you know, my, you know, my father had a penicillin allergy. So does that mean I'm going to have a penicillin allergy? And it, it, the answer to that is not yes, um, because it's, it's a, um, combination of exposure versus genetic predisposition and so you know we do know that any sort of allergy as it's as the genetic predisposition is inherited down the line it's not usually the specific allergy as much as it is the predisposition to have some sort of what we call a topic disorder but how that manifests is more than likely going to be a factor of your environment um, you know, you're going to develop something more than likely, but what it is, is probably going to be, you know, determined by um, your environment. I've always felt that question when other, it was asked of other um, physicians or allergists, immunologists, they always kind of said the same thing with you and kind of chuckled. It's like, okay, this is a loaded question here, but I'll answer it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of, and, and, it, and it's not even just for allergies and asthma. I mean, take my talk and um, apply it with autoimmune disorders. Sure. Um, there is a whole level of research that, you know, probably has started going on linking those because these same immune changes that you're seeing could also fuel um, autoimmune disorders as well. So, so you did talk about earlier um, lowering the ozone particle standards. So, for example, you said once upon a time it was 75 and now 70. So how do you, does one um, go about addressing helping to lower that standard? It seems kind of a bit complicated process. And how, how many years pass before it's actually lowered? Um, well, as you see, that was in 
2000, it, but 2008 to, was the was what it was in 2008 was 75. So um, I don't know if there's actually a um, a time frame in terms of every seven or ten years that they they look at lowering it or not. Um, but this is all linked to you know legislation, and so um, you know, and there was a lot of press not long ago about the um there was something that was was put through some sort of legislation that was put through but that also um um gave you know kind of the the epa back some of their power that donald trump had taken taken away so whatever you know whatever um aisle part of the aisle you fall mm -hmm. on um you know the, he, he had kind of um, reeled in the the epa um and so you know that that some of that power was given back to them. So, you know, that was thought from an environmental perspective to be a good thing. But, you know, basically what you what you need to do, and it's, it's you need to figure out what the, you know, what legislation is being brought out there. Um, and you, you know, is starting probably first at a local level. Um, so finding out who are your representatives and, you know, what, what bills are they backing what are they what are they doing um and what's going on within the state level and that's probably what i, rec I recommend doing first um you know there are all sorts of organizations who you know go to washington and advocate um there's a there's an organization called the medical consortium for um for climate change and that um is is mostly medical professionals but you know who go who will go to washington and, and you know talk to legislators um you know and the asthma and allergy network they do it in terms of you know for asthma and allergy um legislation um and so you could you could tap in with some of those groups um and certainly you know join within their efforts because yeah it does seem kind of daunting on a personal like a, an individual level um to try and and you know shape some of these policies sure everybody needs a little help with when it comes to working on the hill we have um, just a few more minutes left, but I did want to ask you about the secondhand smoke issue. Mm -hmm. um, kids that are, or anybody, right, that is potentially exposed to second or third hand smoke over a long period of time um, with whatever that environment could potentially look like, once mm -hmm. they're removed for an extended period of time, um, Will they bounce back and recover? Let's say they had some lung damage or whatever um, may have been uh, happened to them. What does that look like once they are taken out of that environment? Well, you know, it it depends on um, it depends on the length of exposure. It depends on how much exposure it was and how much damage was done, because I mean, we do know. So, you know, one of the main reasons why this all came to be was, you know, it seemed like kids, you know, despite genetics, you know, would develop asthma more if they had parents who smoked or caregivers who smoked. And so, you know, that was the first that was the first thing. So what changes that the tobacco exposure caused in their airways um and as you imagine it's inflammation it's going to be increasing the bronchial hyper responsiveness all of those things those are things that yes if you take them out of the environment particularly children who you know bounce back a little quicker they're probably going to going to stop exacerbating as often meaning that the disease will improve now will they no longer have asthma more than likely not because whatever change has occurred has altered the way they respond to other things so you know this is this is almost kind of the same argument as you would make with the pollution exposure is that once you alter that and you um, change the way that your body responds to pollen inhaled pollen or inhaled you know strong odors toxic toxic chemicals i don't know things like that they clean with um that the the responsiveness the response that viruses so the response that you get from that is probably still going to be there you're still going to get some hyper responsiveness because the it's kind of like the the it's already been set preset to do that based on your exposure but will you have as many active issues with it if you're not chronically exposed um probably not um and if you're an adult and you have somehow have managed to get chronic lung disease from just being around 
smokers from second and third hand, um, you know, that's, that's another issue because we do know, you know, chronic asthmatics or people with chronic lung disease who, you know, do not get adequate treatment. And part of it does depend on getting adequate treatment for their disease. Their, their airways will actually get to a point where they don't respond to the medicines anymore. They seem not to be able to open up if you take some albuterol. So we do see that, that we, the airways undergo some remodeling when there's been too much exposure, too much damage. And once they've been remodeled, they're never the same after that. Um, so even though you may get your symptoms in a better place, um, your airways themselves have been changed. Sure. Once the damage is done, it's kind of irreversible, so to speak. Um, one last question we have one um, from our audience. Are gas stoves really the danger that has surfaced recently? That is a very, very good question. Um, and again, this came down to um, kids with, I mean, kids with asthma. And so, you know, as we're looking at you know, so everyone can jump on the, you know, smoking, you know, kids around tobacco smoke um, and development of asthma, or, you know, even kids developing allergies and then developing asthma, you know, on that band, bandwagon and, you know, also the, with the air pollution. Um, but, you know, it's, it's as you, you know, as you start to ask the questions about why do we see so much more of this, as you start to actually ask about the environment that the, the children are living in, um, that's when you start to kind of make the connections. Um, and so, yes, I mean, that clearly, um, you know, you can have your gas stoves and gas fireplaces well vented and you're going to have less of an issue, but clearly you still, there isn't 100% venting. And so you're still going to have, and we do know when, when natural gas burns, um, that it does release these, these pollutants that yes um and again this probably comes down to well are you more susceptible to that because just like anything else you could have a child who grows up in a house that had all gas appliances that never had any issue well more than likely they maybe never they had no family history of asthma they had no family history of atp they had no, none of those other genetic factors that may contribute to it or other genetic factors that we don't even know about so yes i mean i do believe that this is a real issue but i don't know that it's going to affect everyone meaning i'm not sure that you can just make a blanket statement and say you know every gas appliance should be outlawed because of this. Um, I think it has the potential to affect certain populations um, and it you know, can be a cumulative effect with everything else that they're exposed to. Sure. Um, Dr. Casado, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and volunteering your time to educate our community. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to this afternoon's webinar. Do please take a few moments to take um, to, to fill out our quick five question survey at the conclusion of today's webinar to help us better serve our patient community. And if you enjoyed today's presentation, please consider making a tax deductible donation to ADA on our website at www.godoada.org. And your contribu contribution helps us to be able to conduct educational in initiatives such as today's webinar and also be a resource for our patients and medical community. This is Lauren Dunlop for Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association, and we hope you have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you so much.